Tonight, Doug Ford slouches back into office with a majority government. It's June 3rd, and this is the Ezra Ranch. Why should others go to jail Why? when you're a biggest carbon yeah. consumer I know? There's 8,500 customers here, and you won't give them an answer. The only thing I have to say to the government about why I publish it is because it's my bloody right to do so. Well, last night was the election in the province of Ontario. Not a lot of people cared. I think one reason is there really wasn't a lot of difference on the key issues amongst the parties. They all supported lockdowns. There really was no daylight between them. Turnout in the previous election was 57%, which isn't great, but it's respectable these days for Canada. This time, voter turnout was just 43%. Most Ontarians either felt like they had no option or they were all the same or they couldn't be bothered. Doug Ford actually lost 400,000 votes as compared to last time. He had 400,000 fewer voters. I think one of them would be me. Why on earth would I vote for the man who presided over some of the most brutal lockdowns in North America? But the NDP opposition lost 800,000 votes. Now, some of those were probably union members. These days, the NDP and in the United States, the Democrats no longer really represent the working man. They're more about extremist woke policies like uh, saying words like Latinx or critical race theory or global warming extremism. That's got nothing to do with actual working men. A lot of private sector unions endorsed Doug Ford, I think that's part of them. Uh, the NDP would have actually won had they held on to their vote from the last election. They had more votes last time than Doug Ford had this time. I think that you would have to call the re-election of Doug Ford, giving him a majority government, I think you have to call that bad news as opposed to the worst news if the Liberals or the NDP had won. The Liberal leader, Steve Del Duca, he threatened to bring back lockdown rules like masks and jabs. Who on earth would vote for that? Remember this video? So today I'm here to announce that if elected, Ontario Liberals will make the COVID-19 vaccine for kids part of the universal roster of vaccines that are required for kids to attend publicly funded schools right across the province of Ontario. And the NDP leader, Andrea Horwath, was just atrocious, really egging on more and harder lockdowns. Would have been the same as the other two, plus economic disaster, socialist style. Hey, I can't uh, help but show you this image of the NDP leader's son. Now, I'm not blaming the mum for the son, although really, who would have a greater design on what a child is besides their parent, uh, besides a brutal misogynist? Um, there he is with a what appears to be a loaded assault rifle. Now, I'm not against people, law-abiding people, owning firearms, but I, I wonder why the media didn't press the NDP princess on her son's uh, fondness for firearms, giving the total unanimity um, on, on the media and the left about banning guns. Um, Doug Ford, who presided over one of the most brutal lockdowns in North America, said during the election that he can't think of any mistakes he made and he has no regrets. Well, you're, you're asking me to point to one thing. I, I can't. You know, I'll tell you one thing. I was the first to stand up there. And if I made a mistake, I think I'm the, the only elected official, politician, whatever you want to call us, that would go up there and say, you know, I made a mistake. I apologize. This is what we're doing to correct it. And I corrected it immediately within 24 hours. And uh, I'm going to continue doing that. I'm, I'm not perfect by any means, I'll, I'll tell you that. It wasn't a gaffe, he reiterated that during the leaders' debate. He presided over a province where parks were closed. Parks, probably the least transmissible place for the virus, the place where you could get exercise. He proposed random police stop and frisk on the street for anyone caught outside. He approved of the use of riot police, not just against a restaurateur in Toronto that was driven by the city, but of course deploying provincial police to crack down 
on the peaceful trucker protest. It was Doug Ford who brought in the Emergencies Act before Justin Trudeau did. It was Doug Ford who went to court to seize the funds in the GoFundMe crowdfund. It was Doug Ford who presided over the mass shutting down of schools and the forced masking of children. Doug Ford who presided over vaccine mandates and segregation. Doug Ford who clearly took orders from any healthcare extremist, giving them the reins of government rather than himself. Horwath won her own seat, but she quit. Del Duca lost his, and he quit. I think those are both good results. Let's see if Ontario can furnish any op opposition to Doug Ford. Um, I think that part of it, if you understand Ontario history, and I'm not an expert, is that Ontario has a bit of a tradition of being a counterweight to Ottawa. That is, whatever party is governing Canada in the federal parliament, Ontario seems to go the other way, which I think is a kind of natural, organic wisdom of the people. When you think about it, the liberals ruled Ontario when Stephen Harper was the prime minister. That's flipped around with uh, Justin Trudeau. Now, there were smaller parties that ran. The Green Party ran, and their one MPP, the leader of the party, was re-elected. Uh, I give thanks to that in part to the broadcasters, which in the one uh, debate that was aired on the provincial state uh, broadcaster called TVO, the only minor party that was allowed in was the Green Party, even though there were several parties on the right that had candidates in every riding that had sitting MPPs. They only gave the coverage, the access, the credibility, their uh, media assent to the Green Party. But of course... The Green Party got less than 6% despite all the help. I think the Green Party serves an important role in Canada. They provide an illusion of opposition. But I watched the leaders' debate in Ontario, and there was really zero difference between what the Green Party was saying and what all the other parties were saying, including Doug Ford. And the Green Party federally has played the same role. They're just there to emphasize and echo what every other party is adopting to make it seem like it's unanimous. I think that it's a fake opposition, a controlled opposition. Uh, there were small parties on the right in this campaign. It happened mainly over the key issue of our time, the lockdowns and the civil liberties bonfire and the junk science and the tyranny of unelected doctor bureaucrats. Derek Sloan, a former MP, had his party, the Ontario party. Jim Carahalios and his wife Belinda had their party, the New Blue Party. There were other MPPs that were kicked out of Doug Ford's caucus. Roman Babber, who's running federally for the Conservatives. Randy Hillier, uh, just to name a few. There were others still. Had they united, there would have been four, five, maybe six or seven. Maybe they would have attracted more MPPs. They would have created a real party that would have been the same size in the provincial parliament as the liberals. There's no way that new party could have been kept out of the, of the uh, leaders' debates. And more than that, they could have been an effective opposition force and earned daily media for it. Because they all splintered, well, united they could have stood, but divided they all fell. There was one interesting piece of news, an independent candidate won. That's very rare in Canada. Her name is Bobby Ann Brady, and she became the MPP in the riding of Haldeman, Norfolk, which, by the way, is where Leslie Lewis is from. Uh, what's interesting about her is that um, she was the assistant, the long-standing 23-year executive assistant to the incumbent conservative MPP for that riding, and she wanted to seek the nomination to succeed him. But Doug Ford didn't have a vote. He appointed his own favorite, a local mayor. So the entire riding association, including the outgoing MPP, endorsed this young lady, and she won as an independent. That is Doug Ford's anti-democratic, undemocratic order that Haldeman Norfolk run his friend rather than this local champion backfired and she was elected as an independent. I think it's quite likely that she will be absorbed 
back into the Ontario PCs, but maybe I'm wrong on that. But it's proof that not everyone was thrilled with Doug Ford. It's, as I say, 400,000 fewer people voted for him. Uh, 14% of the electorate that voted last time just didn't vote this time. People were so demoralized. Let me say a word about those small parties on the right that I referred to earlier. Jim and Belinda Carajalios, their new blue party got 2.7% of the vote. Derek Sloan's Ontario party, 1.8% of the vote. These are tiny numbers. If you add them together, you're getting to around where the Green Party was. But it, in the case of merged parties, one plus one can be three because you have a momentum. I say again, had the small parties on the right united, I think they might have been able to punch through in a few ridings. Alas, we'll never know. <laughs> there were a lot of parties running. I'm looking at the uh, Elections Ontario homepage. The Communist Party ran candidates. They got 0.04% of the vote. And you might laugh and say, ha, that's a good sign. No, no, no. It's a sign that you don't need the Communist Party in Ontario because all the extreme authoritarian ideas that the Communist Party would have proposed They've already been absorbed and promulgated by Doug Ford and the Conservatives and egged on by the Liberals and the NDP. Who needs a Communist Party when every one of their ideas, from treating people as prisoners to censoring and silencing dissenting doctors, who needs a Communist Party when your Conservative Party does those things? I like the election of the one independent. And I thought it was interesting what happened in the city of Brampton. In Brampton East, the MPP there, his name is Guritan Singh. You might recognize that. He's the brother of the federal NDP leader, Jagmeet Singh. But he lost this time. He got thumped, actually. He got just 30% of the vote, losing to a conservative candidate who was also Sikh, by the way. It's very interesting to me what's happening in the Sikh community. There are Sikhs in every party. And there seems to be a Sikh anger with the Singh family, Jagmeet and Gurutam. Um, there's fascinating videos all over social media of members of the Sikh community sort of chasing Jagmeet Singh around at public events, going to his events, finding him on the street and hollering at him, driving by and hollering at him, calling him a sellout saying that he's selling out to the tyrant. And I thought, well, maybe this is some internecine quarrel within that ethnic community that I just don't understand. But we had our reporter, Lincoln Jay, talk to these guys, and I've tried my best to figure out, no, I think it's what it looks like on the face of it. I think these Sikh activists truly think that Jagmeet Singh has sold out, including selling out to... Justin Trudeau federally. I don't know why they would be mad at Gurritan singing provincially unless it's just the two brothers or peas in the pod. Remember that during the trucker convoy, many Canadians discovered something that maybe they had only a vague sense of before, that an enormous number of truckers in Canada, for whatever reason, happened to be Sikh. And there were quite a few trucker protesters at the Ottawa convoy who I think had a political awakening. I follow one fellow on, on Twitter. I think his name is Parminder Singh. And he's a Sikh trucker who came alive and he's become this amateur pundit every day with new short videos. I think a lot of Sikhs had their politics flipped on by the authoritarian uh, crushing of civil rights by Trudeau. And I think they're just actually appalled that Jagmeet Singh, who held some, holds himself out as such a pure idealist, would give support to Trudeau. I think we should take these Sikh critics at face value. And I think it bodes very ill for Jagmeet Singh. Maybe he'll lose his seat in the next election too. Maybe that's why he's joined up with Trudeau. He wants to delay and defer the next election as long as possible. Um, so why did this all happen? Why did Doug Ford win when Aaron O'Toole was thrown out, when Jason Kenney was thrown out? Well, first of all, Aaron O'Toole and Jason Kenney were not defeated in a general election, but rather by their party. Their conservative parties had no more time for them. I think uh, federally, the truckers were the proximate cause of Aaron O'Toole's departure. In Alberta, there were a lot of things, including the fact that Alberta has a tradition 
of having new parties to throw out the old, and those new parties typically being of the right. And in Alberta, independent media, including Rebel News, is very strong. True North is there, but also the Western Standard. Um, that's the name of the magazine I used to run 15 years ago. It's been revived in Alberta as a website, and it's quite conservative. So you have a lot of independent, Western-oriented, freedom-oriented journalism in Alberta that I think really connected with people. And the fact that backbenchers in that party were not thrown out for criticizing the lockdowns. So I think there was a real democracy there, real choices. But here in Ontario, as soon as MPPs were kicked out of the party by Doug Ford, they were anathematized not just in politics, but by the media. The media treated anyone kicked out by Doug Ford as cranks, as weirdos. They echoed Doug Ford's own language of those yahoos and covidiots. I think that you have a political and journalistic monoculture in Ontario. You had no real choices. You had no real conversation. Like I say, the Green Party was added as controlled opposition to a government run debate. TVO is the government owned provincial TV station in Ontario. You had no real alternative. And I say again, it didn't help that Derek Sloan and Jim Carahalios and Randy Hillier and the others were splittist and made it impossible for a freedom oriented small party to, to put it down any roots. I think Doug Ford today is less atrocious than he was six months ago when he was brutally enforcing the lockdown. But Doug Ford will literally say anything his handlers tell him to say if they show him a few polls to convince him it's the politically pragmatic thing to do. Don't think for a second that Doug Ford would not lock down Ontario again if his handlers told him to do so. The liberal leader, Del Duca, threatened to re-lock down. He didn't wait for the fall. He said he wanted to do it. I think that's one reason people were spooked by him. But you really doubt Doug Ford would mask and lock us down again, too? Hmm. Stay with us for more on this with our friend Mary Eagle next. Well, I'm always happy to see politicians quit. If you are, too, here's a few videos that'll make you feel better. And I'm going to keep working to earn your confidence each and every day. I'm going to keep doing that. But tonight, it's time for me to pass the torch, to pass the baton, to hand off the leadership of the NDP. And you know what? It makes me sad, but it makes me happy because our team is so strong right now. Now, to be clear, this isn't the outcome that we had hoped for and worked hard for. And yes, it's true, I am disappointed to not have been successful here in my home community, my home riding of Vaughan Woodbridge. And I just want to say again, I have no doubt that the women and men that Ontario Liberals have elected to the legislature will do their part, in fact, will do more than their part, to help grow a new and energetic progressive movement here in Ontario. It will, however, be a movement that will be led by a new leader. Earlier this evening, I informed our party president of my decision to step down from the leadership of our party, and I have asked him to meet with the executive to set a leadership contest for as soon as is reasonable. Yeah, that was last night in Ontario's election. I, I feel like the whole thing was uh, anticlimactic, and I I'm not alone. Voter turnout in Ontario was atrociously low. Why bother? There really wasn't much choice between Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Joining us now via Skype from uh, Port Coburg, Ontario, is our friend Tamara Ugolini. You might be wondering why I'm in the boardroom here. It's because the main studio I usually use is being occupied by a very special guest making some special videos. I'll tell you about that another time. But let's go to Tamara Ugolini now. Great to see you today. I feel underwhelmed. I feel anticlimactic. I didn't feel like I had a champion in this election. I didn't feel like I had a meaningful choice. I mean, it was all degrees of bad to me. Mm -hmm. Doug Ford probably was the least worst of the three big leaders, but anyone who 
oversees brutal lockdowns, mandate mandates vaccines, uh, denounces protesters who are peaceful, invokes his own emergencies act, seizes money like from the I, like really, uh, how different was he on the key issues of the day than Justin Trudeau? So. I don't know, count me as one of the 14% of Ontarians fewer that voted this time from last time. I understand it's the lowest voter turnout in Ontario history. I'm still checking that, but it doesn't surprise me. What do you think, Tamara? Well, I've I've checked the same at at 43% voter turnout. That appears to be the lowest, uh, the, the second lowest voter turnout happened, I guess, in 2011. So it just speaks volumes as to the fact that people are are tired. Obviously, the Uniparty is now very uninspiring. No one aligned fully with what they all were touting, which was just varying degrees of one another. There was no real opposition. And no one's enthused. The people aren't enthused by any of these leaders enough to actually get out and vote as evidenced by this record breaking voter turnout in Ontario's history. Yeah, you know, I I see some of the media complaining that the federal Conservative Party is too uh, too much of a brawl. that They're fighting each other too hard, which is a strange thing. You want politicians to disagree. So you have a choice. I love that there's a real difference on real issues between Patrick Brown, Jean Charest, Pierre Polyev, good, and let's make a choice. Mm-hmm. And and it's very exciting, and I think it's revving people up, and you'll at least know what the federal conservatives stand for, whoever they choose. I don't think you could say the same because there were no sharp differences amongst these parties. Um, you know, I, I remember watching the debates uh, run by the government broadcaster at the provincial level, TVO, all of the questions were uh, limited to areas of great agreement and consensus amongst the mainstream elites. There were no questions about civil liberties other than for about one second when the liberal candidate prepared, prepared pretended to care about uh, you know, unreasonable search and seizure of people on the streets during the lockdown. There was like about mm-hmm. 10 seconds about civil liberties in the whole debate they cared more about global warming than they cared about the civil liberties in front of the last two years. And I really think it's awful in Ontario. And I, I don't think it's much of a victory other than a victory on paper. I suppose it's the only victory that counts. But I don't know. I thought it was a, 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 a weak day for democracy. I blame the media, too. What do you think? Yes. Yeah, I think indefinitely a weak day for democracy, again, as evidenced by that voter turnout. But I wonder, too, if a lot of the liberals who obviously didn't align with Del Duca's sentiments, especially, I think, as he tried to mandate a major campaign, part part of his campaign was trying to mandate the COVID injectables for children at school. And so I wonder that if liberals are just so stubborn that they would rather stay home and not vote than to actually get out and switch to a different party. Um, I mean, the illegal the illegal carting that Ford tried to put in place after he already decimated small businesses and terminated workers who didn't want to comply with uh, a mandated medical procedure. I wonder if uh, if he's he's learned anything from that over the last two years that, you know, touting and and letting the Ontario Science Table essentially have free reign into policy making decisions. And we saw that that was based more on political science than actual science. So I hope that that there's been some sort of refreshment wake up call here for Ford that he will say, say, you know, obviously people, the tides have turned now, people are sick of the lockdowns. No one discussed any of the lockdowns and the policies and the measures that were put in place during the campaign trail, which I find very concerning because we lived under essentially totalitarian rule for the better part of two years under the Doug Ford regime. But I guess one way to look at this also isn't necessarily a cheer on for the fact that Ford won and he gained more seats, but rather a cheer on that the other two were so completely decimated that you saw both party leaders now resigning. Del Duca and Horwath uh, are both passing the torch, so to so to speak, onto someone new to handle and manage the parties because they just were obviously didn't have their their things together enough to actually garner more support and more seats. The NDP lost uh, what was it eight uh, nine seats, and uh, Del Duca only gained one. He's not even official 
the Liberals are not official party status, neither were they the last time around. Uh, so I think that there's a small win there that you just saw that Ontarians definitely didn't want the other two. Yeah, that's what I said. It's a, a bad election, which is slightly better than a worse election. I um, I was about to say, well, maybe the leadership campaigns for the Liberal Party and the NDP will provide better leaders. And I, I just know that's not going to happen. I know that with every passing year, those two parties are engulfed more by wokeism, mm -hmm. by identity politics, by really a, a form of extremism. Uh, the mm -hmm. Liberals haven't really cared about civil liberties in a very long time. The NDP haven't really been a party of the workers for a very long time. It was interesting how many labor unions did not endorse the NDP this time. I don't know. I mean, I've learned, I mean, I'm 50 years old. And so a lot of naivete is being beaten out of me over the years through bad experience. And I've learned that things can always get worse. That's actually, that's not a pessimistic point of view. It's just, it's, it's actually the opposite. It's saying, you know, however, th there may be some good things today that we lose if we change. I, I think that the next NDP leader will be so diabolically opposed to, to civil liberties. It's going to be atrocious. I noted in my monologue, the Communist Party of Ontario had like 0.04 percent of the vote because you don't need the Communist Party. You've got all your authoritarian needs provided mm -hmm. by at least two opposition parties and most of the time by the government. I don't know. I'm just... Uh, I'm frustrated by it, and I'm trying to keep my hope alive by fo focusing on the federal level. What do you think? Yeah, well, I wonder too if the federal at the federal level, for instance, the NDP is how they lost seats po uh, provincially, is because of how distasteful the Jagmeet Singh has conducted himself over the last two years as well. Just complete disregard for the working class, which typically is their voter base. Uh, we saw that three NDP they lost their three seats in Brampton which was a fairly stronghold. Jagmeet's brother lost his seat. Um, the deputy leader lost her seat as well. So I think that people are starting to recognize on both political spectrums, both provincially and federally, just how much the leaders of those parties and the direction that they're heading have been inept failures over the last two years. And uh, as I said before, it's maybe not a cheering on for the conservative win necessarily, but uh, cheer on for the decimation of that radical left. And I think that if we were to have a federal election now, as opposed to, you know, just shy of one year ago, you would see more of that pendulum swinging back to the right once again, because I think a lot of the sleepy Canadians, as evidenced by Ontario's election last night, have, have awoken and recognize that we're not getting out of this mess that we're in as a country or as a province by continuing to pander to those woke lefties. Yeah, you call it a uniparty, and it's true. Jagmeet Singh is the only reason why Justin Trudeau maintains a his government and acts as if he has a majority. And, and I keep seeing these little videos pop up on social media of other Sikh Canadians chasing down Jack Mead Singh and denouncing him. And at first I thought it was some internal battle or something, but no, they, they're they saying you're a sellout, you're, you're supporting the tyrant. I think they actually really, really mean that. And that could explain the loss of the seats in Brampton. I think Jack Mead Singh is terrified of going to the polls, which is why he cut this deal with Trudeau. Mm -hmm. I think he may well could lose. Again, I fear what comes after him. I don't know. I uh, I look to other places for hope. I look to the federal level where the Conservative Party seems to be reviving itself. I look to Alberta, where Jason Kenney was thrown out clearly over his lockdownism, which was out of touch with the province. So I'm looking elsewhere besides Ontario for my hope. But uh, Tamara, I really appreciate your reporting, including last night's live stream. And uh, keep fighting for freedom in, in Coburg. I remember that's how we met you. You were a yeah, fight science right. client who got some outrageous Doug Ford fine. So it's great that you joined us and been fighting for freedom ever since. Yeah, well, thank you, Ezra. And for, of course, taking a chance on me as well. Um, it's been really great learning experience being with the Rebel. And I look forward to seeing how the future goes as well. And actually, just before we close out, too, I wanted to mention that Ontario is now the eighth province in Canada or territory that holds a majority conservative government. So if that lends anything into how Canadians are feeling across coast to coast to coast, 
You know, I think that if we were to see something happen federally, um, and that's probably why Justin Trudeau chose last summer to call a snap election, because more Canadians are waking from their sleep, I, I hope. I hope this is evidence of that. And they're they're done with the, the wokeism and they want to get back to regular, strong Canadian values once again. Well, from your mouth to God's ears. Great to see you, my friend. Take care. Thanks, Ezra. You as well. Right on. There you have it. Tamara Ugolini from Coburg, who was reporting on the Ontario election. Stay with us. Your letters to me the next. Welcome back. Your viewer feedback on my show about the media party reporter who bantered with me a bit. Mark Saulnier says, if only she challenged the whole the woke liberal and NDP socialists, the ones who are actually in power, with the same vigor as she would Pierre. Yeah. And arguing with me instead of arguing, say, with the CBC or some mighty uh you know, brand that, you know, the Globe and Mail or the Toronto Star or the CBC. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that we're nothing, but I've never seen her with the rage or the passion or the plain spokenness take on power the same way she takes on less power. I'm not saying that Pierre Polyev is nothing, and I'm not saying he shouldn't be scrutinized. And same with Rebel News. I think we're quite something. But it, it, it's very noticeable that a global news journalist thinks that she's totally challenging Justin Trudeau by saying, hey, come on, where's your censorship package already? Hey, come on, how, not, how come you're not going harder on climate change? She thinks that's speaking truth to power, whereas she calls Pierre Pauly of a conspiracy theorist liar. Barry Forte says a journalist with global news is an oxymoron on steroids. You know, um, I'm old enough to have known a little bit uh, Israel Asper, who is the Asper who created Global News. He created a great TV station, really from nothing, um, starting in, in Manitoba, and he built out from there. And it was a mighty and outstanding news agency. I, I think that that company has really strayed from his vision of excellence, and I'm, and I'm sorry he's not around to guide it. Chud67 uh, BBC says... As is the case with Biden, who thinks Trudeau actually has 6 million followers? You're talking about his 6 million Twitter followers. Yeah, there's a lot of um, fake or robot or bot followers on Twitter. It's funny because when um, Elon Musk said he was making a massive $40 billion plus offer for the company, he later said, whoa, the company estimates only 5% of their followers are fake, but the number could be many times that. And if Joe Biden is close, I don't know, going from memory, close to 100 million followers and half are fake. Right there, that tells you that Twitter's number can't be real. I wonder how many people are fake and if they're just bots that someone else set up or if it's what Trudeau and Biden purchased to make themselves look big and important. It wouldn't surprise me with either of those men. Well, that's our show for today. Until Monday, on behalf of all of us here at Rebel World Headquarters, to you at home, good night. Keep fighting for freedom. And let me leave you with our video of the day. Our friend David Menzies um, just shows the state of Doug Ford's conservative party. David Menzies, who's been to a dozen Ford fests, who's been the, you know, other than Joe Warmington, probably the most friendly pro-Ford reporter in Ontario, banned from coming to Doug Ford's events. Even though he was personally invited, I think the fact that the Ontario government and Doug Ford are lurching into Justin Trudeau's style censorship and exclusion of journalists. Tells you all you need to know. I'll leave you that video. Bye bye. David Menzies for Rebel News here at the Toronto Congress Center. And folks, I'm here for a Ford rally. And guess what? I have an invitation from Premier Doug Ford himself. Check it out. Hey, this is Doug Ford calling, leader of the Ontario PCs. You can reach our team at 1-800-903-6453 or email at info at ontariopc.com. I'm inviting you, your family and friends, to our rally in Toronto to get it done. It's Wednesday, June the 1st at the Toronto Congress Center, 650 Dixon Road in Etobicoke. Doors open at 7 p.m. and there's no cost. That's Wednesday, June the 1st. 
at the Toronto Congress Centre, 650 Dixon Road, and doors open at 7 p.m. With your help, our PC party is building Ontario and keeping costs down for families like yours. Head to OntarioPC.ca. Click on Rallies and please RSVP to let us know if you're coming. Admission is free. I hope to see everyone there. Yeah, that's what came across my phone just a few days ago. Uh, a personal invitation, as far as I can tell, from the Premier. And I'm very grateful for that, folks, because you see, when we were here last month for the campaign kickoff, well, I was shocked because I've been going to Ford Fests and Ford family events for maybe 15 years. I'm always welcomed with open arms. <laughs> Not this time. Check it out. But I understand I why. You leave now. Why? Zach. Why? Why is that? Because we're not giving you accreditation to this okay, event. Then. So, so yeah, we're gonna ask you to leave this. Under the Trespass and Property Act, we will remove you from. Okay. The who are you? I work for the party, and I'm. Okay. Can I see some ID then? It's right here, sir. It just says tour 2022. Yeah. We're gonna have to ask you to leave. Okay. Please. What What is your name then? So we have uniform police on site that will come and remove you. So I don't even know. Hold who them. Can I ask you why? That's a fair question. I see no, other media are. here. We're not, you're not invited to the event and you're not checked in. You're not coming into the event. But do you have to be invited? I see all sorts of people coming yeah, in everybody here. Everybody here is invited and they're all here for the right reasons. So Yeah, so I was considered uh, persona non grata, the same with uh, Joe Warmington of the Toronto Sun. Um, and it's inexplicable because Joe Warmington, I think, has given the Ford family the fairest coverage over the past 20 years, and he was uh, given the bums rush as well. But we are indeed here on an invitation basis, so they can't possibly kick us out again, or, or can they? Oh, and by the way, just to show I'm a really good guest, well... A good guest doesn't come empty-handed. I have a gorgeous cherry cheesecake for the Premier. We know he loves cherry cheesecake. Check out the video evidence. I'm going to pour this on, but if you don't like cherries, eat blueberries. If I wasn't Premier, I'd open up a cheesecake factory. That, my friends, is the Premier's cheesecake. Friends, stay safe, stay healthy, and these are some of the fun things you can do when you're self-isolating. Oh, ho, ho. So there you have it, folks. A party awaits, a cheesecake awaits. Let's go and join the revelry or not. Hi, guys. Hi. Unfortunately, it's a private event tonight. Oh, I know that. I've been invited. You have not been invited, unfortunately. Here you go, officer. Listen. Unfortunately, you're not invited in today. Oh, I am. Listen. Well, according to the party, you're not invited in today. Um, that's not true. I have an invitation from Doug Ford. Here is a printed transcript. That's not the, that's not the invitation. Oh, you're the fellow that kicked me out last time, too. Yeah, yeah. Who are you, by the way? My name is Zach. And I am Zach who? That's it. My name is Zach. Zach. Yeah. Okay, then. Well, I'm... an election team member. My name is Zach. Okay. Are you a security guard? I'm a security representative for the party. Okay, yes. can I see your security license, please? You can see my tour badge if you like. Uh, no, I'm not interested in that. That could be anyone's. Okay, if well, you I'm, are. I am telling you that you're not welcome here based on the trespass to okay. This is. Uh, it, it's okay. It doesn't even matter. The gentleman doesn't have to show you, but you're you're just not welcome here. Okay. okay. Here is a I transcript, would, sir. I would I would appreciate you. I would appreciate you. Please, just oblige me, and you're not welcome here. Okay. I you have film on the street there. That's the only yeah, five that's the totally other. Oh, is that right, Zach? Yeah, really? Yeah. Okay. How much yeah, do you right. charge the haunted house, by the way? What? What? Okay, yeah. That's, that's yeah. No, no. Yeah, I have an go. invitation. Sir, can you please make your way to the sidewalk, please? I don't think you outrank the premier of the province, sir. And I have an audio invitation. Sir, okay, then. So, does why does the premier invite me? And then you guys say, not only am I not invited, you won't even give me a reason why I'm not invited. I just told you why you're not invited. No, you didn't. What is the reason? You're not well, invited because you've event. tried this before. We didn't allow you in. So tried, uh, For 15 years, I've been coming to Ford family events. 15 years, more. Sure. And I've been wel welcomed with open arms. Is it too much to ask you're to get it? You're trespassing now so we can make your way to the sidewalk. I'm, I'm on the sidewalk. You're not, right the sidewalk. not on the sidewalk. This, this, this is right. private right. property. Yeah. The Where those people are standing there. right there, if we could ask you to please. Who, who is the private property owner of this building, it's sir? the Toronto Congress Centre. Okay, so is this taxpayer supported? Uh, no, it's a private entity. So. All right. Well, folks, we tried. And um, 
even with an invitation, I you know the the. You're, you're feel feel free to cover and record us, but we're just going to ask you to go. Oh, that's very generous of you, officer. I really appreciate that. You see, I have an invitation here. Okay. I have an audio recording of that invitation, and I why am I not being allowed in and not even given a reason, officer? I'm not trying to give you a hard time. I just want some transparency, if that's possible. So we're obviously hired by their security team. And that's all I could tell you. I'm not going to engage in further conversation with you. Okay. And they have their provisions, and we're simply providing security for this venue here. Okay. I see. Just following orders, then. Well, I have a job to do, and I'm going to do it. Okay. Yeah. Well, there you have it, folks. Even though I have a bona fide invitation to attend this Ford rally, we are journalists non grata. We are guests non grata. Um, funny that, and yet um, obviously the. CBC, the Toronto Star, you know, the people that Doug Ford used to call a bunch of maggots, uh, they're allowed in. And, you know, I didn't even get a chance to give him this beautiful cherry cheesecake. I'm just standing here like Richard Harris in MacArthur Park. You know, I don't think I can take it because it took so long to bake it. And I don't think I'll have that recipe anymore. But you know what, folks? No, sir. When it comes to cherry cheesecake these days, tastes like tyranny. For Rebel News, I'm David the Menzoid Menzies. Wow. Probably a ton of preservatives.